Jekyll and Hyde. Ohio State defeats Michigan State 48-3. to We've seen the Buckeyes explode against uh, the lesser teams in the Big Ten. We saw them put it all together against Penn State in the fourth quarter and looking like the best team in the country and the most talented and explosive and dominant uh, along the defensive front. And we saw them collapse in the second half against Iowa and get trounced. And, of course, the Oklahoma showing against a very good Sooners team. Now we see them take on not the most talented team in the country in Michigan State. The Spartans are really good. They should finish with two wins to finish at 9-3 and three in the regular season. They're a very good football team. They're one of the 15 to 25 best teams in America. But they are not nearly as talented as Ohio State, something we talked about with a, a number of bloggers and broadcasters across the country this week on Mark Rogers TV. And uh, that Sparty always plays Ohio State close. It's always meaningful uh, ever since Urban Meyer arrived on campus. And it's been close, close, close. And Michigan State pulls off many upsets. Similar to two years ago, going into this game, two touchdown underdog, it looked like Michigan State was playing the better football. Ohio State coming off the big loss, of course, at Iowa. And what do the Buckeyes do? They stomp Michigan State. Okay, Ohio State was without uh, Dante Booker and also Jerome Baker, two of their best linebackers, very explosive players, especially Baker off the edge. They were without those two guys, which seemed like it would have been a big loss for this team trying to run around in coverage and keep track of Michigan State's wide receivers and tight ends. Uh, because Michigan State has done a complete reversal from what their reputation is. The last two weeks, Michigan State has thrown the ball more than anybody in America, almost 60 passes per game with Brian Lewerke uh, going to multiple overtimes against Northwestern, pulling out the big win at home against Penn State that set up this showdown for the Big Ten Eastern Division. So the Buckeyes, without those two players, key defensive players, and Lewerke converted a third and 18 uh, then on the fourth down after the scramble on the first drive of the of the game. And uh, if you look back at what uh, Lewerke was able to do against Penn State last week with his talented group of wide receivers, and that's something, again, we highlighted this week in our discussions uh, with the only colors, uh, the SB Nation platform for Michigan State, is that Michigan State's wide receivers, considering Ohio State's struggles in the secondary, that could be the big advantage with the likes of Felton Davis, and Ryzen and Cody White, but this was not the case. But on the first series, it looked like it might be. Lewerke got loose, converted on the third and 18, and then the fourth and two, actually. So Michigan State in business, but Ohio State with two sacks stopped him right there, and then it was off and running from there. Uh, Ohio State just completely dominated this game, 48-3. to three. It was 35 to nothing in the second quarter. Ohio State ran the ball. They ran the ball. That's what it all came down to. So Urban Meyer made the comment this week that Ohio State has gotten away from its power running game. And part of that has been getting uh, enamored with the skills of JT Barrett and more so the opportunities and the number of playmakers potentially on the outside with KJ Hill and Benjamin Victor, Paris Campbell, Johnny Dixon in particular. And the other obvious uh defensive ploy by the likes of Iowa in teams before is that they have simply said run pass option plays. We take the ball out of J.K. Dobbins and Mike Weber, but mostly Dobbins' hands, and we force Barrett to keep it. And J.T. Barrett's a very accomplished and capable runner, but he's not going to explode on the defense, create the big play. So Dobbins had six carries for 51 yards against Iowa. And yeah, you could say the game was a blowout, and that's why they had to go to the pass, and Dobbins only had six carries and Weber a handful of carries. But that game was 17-all with a couple minutes left in the first half. It was 31-17, two-score game. You still run the ball. And Urban Meyer made the comment this week that we have to run the ball regardless of what the defense is telling us. We have to run it with Dobbins and Weber out of the tailback position. And boy, did they run it. Mike Weber couple explosive plays in this game, nine carries for a buck 62. J.K. Dobbins, 18 for 124. Weber had a 47-yard touchdown. Weber had a 66-yard touchdown. Dobbins was doing his thing in the secondary, shaking and baking and dropping guys all over the field. And Billy Price, you saw the 
all Big Ten All-American center for Ohio State on a number of occasions, got to the second level to open up that gap up the middle that we saw Weber run through for the 47 and 66 yard touchdowns. And Ohio State ran it for 335 yards. That includes a 17 yard snap over uh, Barrett's head. So 360, 352 on the ground for Ohio State against a Michigan State defense that even against Notre Dame's vaunted rushing attack gave up well less than 200 to Notre Dame, 102 to Michigan, less than 100 to Penn State, 60-some yards to Penn State, Saquon Barkley, and Ohio State runs it for 335. Outstanding performance by the Buckeyes, but again, this is Jekyll and Hyde. Should they be vaulted into the college football playoff conversation? No. A lot of things have to happen. They got to defeat Michigan in resounding fashion and hope Michigan arrives to that game at nine and two. But uh, Ohio State committed to the run, not getting too fancy uh, with the screen game as they typically do. And uh, the Buckeyes win it 48 to three. At one point when this game was still meaningful and the Buckeyes were tacking on touchdown after touchdown, Ohio State ran at 16 of 17 plays. Meanwhile, the defense was holding Michigan State to negative 12 yards in 12 plays. It was reminiscent of the fourth quarter stand against Saquon Barkley in Penn State when he had nine carries for negative 17 yards. When Ohio State brings it along the defensive front, there is no one better. But they don't bring it all the time, as we have seen against Oklahoma and Iowa. Damon Arnett with an interception. The first one on this particular drive uh, was called back because of a Draymond Jones targeting penalty. So Jones had to miss the end of the first half and the rest of the game. But he should be back for the Illinois game. But Arnett picked, up, picked off a pass later in the drive to make up for that. Ohio State wins at 48-3. to Michigan State should still finish strong as they have Maryland and Rutgers left. So you would think Sparty at seven and three would finish at nine and three, but clearly show that they're not quite ready for a Big Ten championship. But a great bounce back year from Mark D'Antonio and his club. But I expected this to be a tussle and Ohio State to win a close one. Uh, the Buckeyes have Illinois next week before they have to travel to the Big House to take on Michigan for most likely the Big Ten. Eastern Division Championship, and there's a number of calculations here, but importantly for Ohio State, they've got the head-to-head -head against Michigan State and against Penn State. If Michigan wins over Ohio State, then you got to go into the calculations uh, and so forth, and then you've got a bunch of two-loss teams stacked up in the Big Ten East with Penn State most likely winning out as well. JT Barrett, a workman like what, 14 of 21 for a buck 83. He threw two picks when it didn't matter at all, and Ohio State wins it going away. All right, we will break down some college football playoff scenarios later this week as we do. And uh, the Buckeyes not necessarily playing themselves back into it, but this is a quality win over a good team that has a solid resume in Michigan State and earned that number 12 ranking thus far in the season. All right, would love to hear what you have to say. I enjoy the comments. I get back to as many as possible. As you can see on many of the videos, there are 50, 60, 70 comments. I can't get to all the comments, but I get, but I get to as many as possible. And I certainly enjoy reading the discussion and the back and forth and the debates between yourself. So subscribe to my YouTube channel for the very best in college football coverage and analysis, not just from myself, but as I say, from the best bloggers and broadcasters in college football. We will see you next time with more instant analysis throughout the day on Saturday.